What's going on, Goof Gang? It is Straw Hat Goofy with another YouTube video for you guys. And today, we're going to be talking about The Eternals. I already did my Eternals non-spoiler review very shortly after I went to the premiere. Now, we're going to get into full spoilers for The Eternals movie because I've been waiting to talk about this movie for literal weeks. So what I'm going to do here is like I want to talk about some of the big plot elements of the movie just to explain kind of like what's going on as well as in relation to what all that means to the rest of the MCU proper because this movie had a lot of big implications for the MCU and I honestly think that when you look past the stupid Metacritic Rotten Tomatoes IMDb score of the movie the audience scores is a lot better but when you look at the scores that are super low I think it stands at like right now 49% on Rotten Tomatoes it's really annoying and it shouldn't be that way but I honestly think this film was really great uh it, honestly it's not the best I put it to like the high mid tier or just kind of like above mid tier just above mid tier but it's not bad in any stretch of the uh, imagination but I really want to talk about just what this means for the MCU what's so important about it what was, what did I really like about it with certain scenes and then get into some of those post credit and mid credit scenes that again are really big when it comes to the MCU proper. So pretty much the Eternals is pretty much about these super immortal beings who turn out to be just glorified robots. I don't even think they're like organic organism robots. They're pretty much robots which is something I honestly didn't really like like because now like the film turns into this thing where it's almost what is it artificial intelligence because it turns out that the celestials who created the eternals also created the deviants who are actually organic beings who evolve and things like that like you and me but they pretty much went haywire and they pretty much went crazy and started eating and killing and you know murdering people so they create and they could be controlled just similar to humans and people but then the, so the celestials in response made the eternals and they made them pretty much into robots that they pretty much can control and take out the deviants, you know, because the deviants are just running wild and they want to get rid of those things. The Celestials created the Eternals as robots, but it's funny because they still, even as kind of robots with implanted memories and all these type of things, they still evolved like people. Like them, their time on Earth has caused them to kind of adopt earthly behaviors and trends and just pretty much assimilate into that society, which is what kind of kicks off the plot of the movie of them finding out that not only is someone killing off their fellow Eternals, like Ajak, who unfortunately died, but it also like showed them that, okay, we need to pretty much like f figure out what's going on here. And they figured out that the Celestials are using the Earth as like a giant egg. It's a freaking egg for other Celestials. So pretty much what the Celestials do is that they send Eternals to pretty much like prepare the planet for insemination and they pretty much, again, I like to call this SpaceX. They have SpaceX with other planets. And then the, there's a baby born, a baby celestial that comes out of the core. And then they take the Eternals, wipe their memories, and then they do it again. And the uh, Celestials have been doing this for millions of years, probably. Like millions and millions and millions of years. Because it's probably as old as time itself, which is a very scary concept. But the Eternals have no idea because again they got their memory wiped because and they have no recollection the character of Athena her mind is starting to collapse on itself because at first it was explained that since she's lived a long life like those memories from that she may have forgotten are coming back and so and like current memories are going away and it's kind of like wibbly wobbly timey wimey in her head it turns out that since she's lived multiple lives and she's got her mind erased so many times then that's pretty much like what's causing like her different lives to kind of like crash into her and things of that sort. When you really think about it, it, it it's weird because the solution for that, for them to cure Athena, was to wipe her mind again. So you would think that would just become a recurring problem, which lends itself to asking the question, how many times did Athena have a mental breakdown and how many times did they suggest rewriting her brain to do that? I don't know. <laughs> Once the Eternals find out that they, you know, they're pretty much preparing this planet that, that they love and that they grew up with for insemination, like making a baby, baby celestial, then they pretty much like come together and they figure out they got to stop it because now they love these people and things of that sort. My question to this, and again, this just, this is just why, because I don't think this was really explained all that much. If the Celestials was going to have them be there for thousands and thousands of years because that's how long it takes a Celestial to be born, why didn't you just tell them the mission from jump from jump? They're loyal to you already. They're pretty damn loyal. And I think if you would have told them right as they were born, like, hey, you're going to go to Earth, you're going to make a Celestial baby, and when it comes out, you're just going to come back. I think they would have been cool with that because they were cool with just 
killing deviants on that planet because they're they're pretty much like dolls they're pretty much like blank slates so you could have just told them that those deviants could have been the good guys for all we know it could have been similar to captain marvel where we were led to believe the scrolls were good and uh, i mean were bad we were led to believe the scrolls were bad and we had no reason to judge them because one in the comics they are bad and two uh the movie told us and we trusted it we wanted to go along with it so it could have been the same situation but the celestials plan just doesn't really make sense and then there's like a big huge exposition dump when cersei just asked them you gotta remember they she asked this question years and years later like yeah like thousands of years later and they just said oh yeah you know we created you with no memories and you're pretty much a robot and you know we make celestials and that keeps the balance in the universe you couldn't tell them that from the beginning i don't know it's it's just and it's stuff like that that just kind of hurts the movie a little bit it just kind of feels like the movie takes a, a more of approach to tell character driven philosophical like tackle big concepts like philosophical concepts about what it means to like live and like how much can you interfere which is great and that's what i really like about the movie it's just in trying to do that you forget to like fill in those other details because then when you think about it you're just like that doesn't really make sense uh turns out icarus is very loyal to the celestials just as uh ajak has been forever but apparently earth is selfish of who we are we think earth is going to change people into the most evil aliens into pretty much saying like oh earth deserves saving you did it with the silver surfer and rides of the silver surfer in every comic book incarnation you did it with homelander where homelander not homelander sorry omni man there's a lot of evil superman and i and i said this in my review icarus reminds me of more of a homelander uh omni man type of character from invincible you guys know omni man from invincible who was a superman type character but turns out he was an alien from another planet who was more evil uh he also reminds me of a little kid from brightburn but that's lesser turns out that icarus is more loyal to the celestials and he wants to prepare the earth for uh i i don't want to say insemination again but i don't want to uh but he wants to pretty much create another celestial well he doesn't but he's just loyal and he just doesn't want to question the celestials so it, he's one of those guys who's shooting lasers like this hurts me more than it hurts you because i love these people too i love earth too but blah, blah, blah. still going along with it dude anyway so now they have to fight against icarus and apparently you need all of the eternals to fight against icarus i don't really think so i mean there's literally eight of y'all y'all could just jump them and they do they eventually like do in the final battle well they kind of do, but they kind of don't. They do the one by one thing. I'm like, you guys can kind of take them out by yourselves. And whatever. Cersei wanted to turn a celestial into like a tree or a stone or something because she has the power to turn non-living things into other things of matter. Like she turned a truck into flowers and she does a lot. Like she turns stone into water, things like that. And this was the first time she did living things. So she turned a living thing in Eternal into a stone, which... Does that mean she's the most powerful one? Honestly, she could be the most powerful one. Like, if she could turn living things into anything, that could be, that's a very OP power. We get to the end of the movie. Uh, there's a giant celestial hand and head coming out of the earth and nobody's gonna question it. It's just gonna be the 10th wonder of the world, I guess. She's happy with her life. She goes back to Jon Snow, sorry, Dane Whitman, AKA the Black Knight, and pretty much a celestial runs up on her, scoops her up, and is like, yo, you were supposed to give us a baby. Now I'm taking you and you're going to be punished. Not only do they take Cersei, but they also take the other remaining uh, uh, internals, uh, Kingo and uh, Fastos, because uh, the baby one turned into a literal baby, the, the child, which I can't remember her name right now. Sprite! It's Sprite. It's Sprite. I knew. Don't come at me. But essentially the Celestials take these characters and they pretty much say like, okay, we're taking you. The other Eternals pretty much go off in their ship to fly the stars and find other Eternals so that they can warn them what they are actually doing. And those ones are Druig, Makari, who is Bay, Baby, don't bother her, and uh, who was the who was the other one? Oh, uh, Thena. Thena. Thena was the one. This is where shit gets great. This is where shit gets great. Okay. Mid credit scene, we find out that those three other Eternals who are in the ship looking for other Eternals, they find one, or more specifically, this Eternal finds them. That is Star Fox. Star Fox, aka Eros, aka Brother of Thanos, and that is awesome because. Fine, I, I've theorized, I've theorized that this movie was going to dive a little bit into the kind of like origin of Thanos because Thanos, Thena, Thena is the auntie of Thanos. So if Thanos ever saw Thena, she'd be like, hey auntie, 
Um, or is she the cousin? I like Auntie better. We'll, we'll go with that. They didn't really get into this that much. There's some Eternals that have the deviant gene, and Thanos is one of those Eternals that has a deviant gene, which is why he looks the way he looks. They never said it in any of the previous movies, but seeing as Star Fox is an Eternal himself, and he's introduced as the brother of Thanos, I think that in the sequel, they're going to pretty much like expand on the relationship between Deviants and Eternals because they're pretty much brothers and sisters, if you really think about it. They're all created by the Celestials and they're brothers and sisters. I didn't even mention Pip the Troll. Pip the Troll shows up, he teleports in, and he's played by Patton Oswalt. The CGI looks really wonky on him. He looks like uh, Beowulf. I don't know if you guys remember Beowulf, but he looks like the animation from Beowulf that was cool back then, but it's not that cool right now. Uh, Pip the Troll shows up, and he's exactly how you would imagine Pip the Troll in live action. He's drinking, he's drunk as hell. He introduces Star Fox, and Star Fox is like, hey, the Celestials have your friends. We gotta go get them. So I think... When it comes to the MCU, because this is like pretty huge, and I think, because I've been thinking this entire time, where exactly is the MCU heading? We have so many parallel paths happening right now. We got the Multiverse of Madness and all the multiverse things that's happening in No Way Home and Doctor Strange 2 and Loki and all those things. Then you have uh, what's been set up in Falcon and the Winter Soldier, where uh, Valentina Conquesa is out here recruiting apparently like the Thunderbolts or the Dark Avengers or something like that. And that was further confirmed in the post credit scene of Black Widow. Then you have the scroll invasion, which I don't know how far they're going to go into that. I think they're probably going to go like what they did with Flashpoint and the Flash TV show, how that clearly should have lasted like at least two seasons, but they kind of restricted it to three episodes, which sucked. Uh, but we have all those. And then we have what I think is what's going to amount to the watcher showing up from what if into the live action because then you've established that there's someone who's watching the multiverse and someone who can pretty much stop those big ass threats will come in and pretty much warn them so i think like right now eternals is setting up that big bad threat so the eternals uh movie sets up the celestials it's almost like these big powerful bads and they essentially at the end of the movie took the strongest characters off the table right they took this they took cersei and all those guys off the table and the only ones that are left get meets another strong character eros and they say hey we're gonna pick a fight with the celestials right and i think that's what's gonna happen i think it's setting the stage for a very grand war between the two and with again with all this star power i still fully believe that even after this movie some of these characters are going to end up dead so i think this is going to probably kick off some type of war where maybe not all the eternals survive during this war with the uh, celestials because this is these are powerful people and this is a war that could potentially like tear the universe apart a very uh universe galaxy ending event and so with this happen going on over here, I think the Watcher might at some point step in and pretty much like say like, hey, shit's going down. We need someone to save this universe, right? So I think I think that right there, first off, is what's going to be happening. Uh, also, the, you know, we have the She-Hulk show coming up. Star Fox has ties to She-Hulk. Uh, you know, they got it on, but and, and not in the best way, if you know what I'm saying. But uh, there's there's just a lot going on with... The, the, the implication of uh, eternal slash celestial war. Another thing I want to talk about is with Eros showing up. Eros pretty much having like a uh, tie to Thanos and that pretty much confirming the existence of the deviant gene. Then I think that the sequel can also deal with the X gene as well. Because you have uh, deviants and Eternals kind of like meshing and then, you know, creating Thanos. But then we still didn't really talk about Eternals meshing with humans. And then what does that create? So I think that also sets up the possibility for the X-Men as well. So I think with just that one mention of Thanos, the brother of Thanos, we get a whole door opening of all these type of things, right? So... That's, that's pretty much the mid credit scene, right? We didn't even get to the post credit scene. And then the post credit scene, we see Dane Whitman. First off, at the end of the movie, we see Dane Whitman watch Cersei get snatched. Her, his girl gets snatched by a giant, her giant ex-boyfriend or something, or her daddy. Her daddy snatches him. <laughs> um, so he, she gets snatched by the daddy. And he says, all right, I guess I gotta, you know, go save my girl, which is very Jon Snow-like, I must say so. Uh, so he goes to find in the post credit scene a sword and he's hyping himself up because obviously it's dangerous and i don't know what part because the black knight has a very convoluted history in marvel comics very convoluted i don't even 
try to get too into it. I do know a little though. So I do know that the ebony blade that the Black Knight uses also holds, I believe, the consciousness of the Black Knights that came before or like just the, the original holder of the Black Knight. So I think that's why he's hyping himself up because he knows once he picks that thing up, he'll be strong enough to go fight the Celestials but he'll probably lose himself in the process. And when he opens it, it seems very sinister. You can hear like voices coming out of it, things of that sort. And right before he picks it up, we hear a voice that asks, are you sure you want to do that? Which, you know, lends credit to how dangerous that blade is. It lends another self to another question, who the fuck said that thing? <laughs> so now I originally thought that that was the Watcher. It sounded very deep. It sounded very Jeffrey Wright. I thought it was the Watcher. Apparently, it's been confirmed that Chloe, that is, the Chloe Zhao has confirmed that that was actually Mahershala Ali, who we all know is playing Blade in the MCU now. What is Blade doing in this movie? Now, somebody in my comments, I made a video about it. Somebody in my comments said that Blade and Black Knight, like, you know, they go way, way back. Like, obviously, Black Knight has been around since, like, the medieval times. So, and I don't think Blade is, like, really that old, right? I think he was turned into a vampire during uh you know just contemporary times like modern times so i don't i don't think that really checks out uh i mean i haven't read the comics so maybe it does but apparently like blade and black knight go way way back and they fought vampires together and i'm looking at dane whitman like this guy fought vampires this guy fought vampires so <laughs> vampires are already, well vampires are already in the mcu because then blade wouldn't be there really but i just need to know what is Blade doing? Why is he talking to Black Knight of all these people? Why is Black Dude talking to Black Knight? It's just, it's just honestly a lot to take in. So, uh, I have nothing. <laughs> I have nothing because one, I don't know much about Black Knight and two, uh, the only thing I can say is, uh, maybe Blade is coming to recruit Black Knight to fight some, um, <laughs> some vampires. But then why would he ask, are you sure you want to do that if he doesn't want him to pick up the Emily Blade to fight vampires? Because what is Dane going to do? currently that is the spoiler review of the video guys or just the spoiler talk just me rambling on about spoilers thank you so much for watching the video uh make sure if you guys want to see more hit that bell hit that subscribe button and hit the like button so that way it helps the algorithm i just want to say thank you to everybody who subscribed we're at 12,000 subscribers now that's that's insane and now i'm going to be making more content for you guys on youtube for sure so make sure you guys stay tuned for that uh follow me everywhere i'm everywhere uh and you guys have a great one see you